Hello. So, the last time we were talking, it was about uh, McGraney's point that even though we can live in these very complicated and extremely sophisticated technological environments, it doesn't mean that our brains have actually changed all that much. So, uh, it gives rise to a delusion that uh, because we're living in this very sophisticated and advanced time, that somehow we ourselves are these very sophisticated creatures. When in fact, we, we're, you know, even though our brains do do amazing things, we also uh, make all kinds of mistakes, rely on all kinds of shortcuts and assumptions <coughs> as we're piloting through our life. So um, this is this point that uh, he's making that we right now in history, and hopefully this remains true after, you know, the pandemic plays out. We are sitting on top of the shoulders of giants, so to speak. That uh, below us is this huge history of trial and error, you know, and so many more failures than we can possibly imagine. Uh, because most of the time we really only see evidence of the successes of various kinds of experiments um, and innovations. Right. Uh, so it, although it's hard to imagine because it seems so bizarre, uh, people who believed that the entire world is sitting on the shell of a tortoise as it slowly creeps its way through the universe uh, are exactly the same level of intelligence, so to speak, as we are. Right. In that they have the same brain. So the same capacities for learning and the same tendencies to become misguided, right? Um, so McGraney goes on to say uh, that we need to keep in mind uh, how powerful social norms are, right? That social norms can lead us in all kinds of weird directions. Um, and we remember this from Hansen, that uh, it's super significant to remember that most social norms, that is most rules that we abide by, are not there because they're true in some like way that we've tested them. They have evolved to protect us from each other, right? And to protect us from ourselves. So that is to say, to keep us from committing acts of aggression or excessive competition that undermine the way groups can function together and the way that we can all kind of help each other uh, to to kind of pursue these collective goals that are larger than any one individual, right? So, but this means that we might believe things that, or, you know, believe that certain behaviors are important, uh, even though they're complete cultural constructs, meaning we built them out of uh, cultural practices and behaviors, uh, rather than they were given to us or handed to us as like a set of ironclad rules, right? Um, so again, you know, in the past when humanity has suffered from these great, you know, plagues, for example, uh, the worst one, um, in recorded history being the black plague, uh, and particularly, uh, the one, the bubonic plague that attacked us in the 14th century, all different kinds of theories emerged, um, in terms of how to, uh, you know, ward off the symptoms of the plague. And you see this happening right now with coronavirus, which is very strange to see something kind of reemerge from, uh, you know, the 14th century. Um, but yeah, people used to whip themselves, you know, uh, thinking that their sin, you know, had, if they were able to purge themselves of sin, then they would be less likely to be infected. Um, you know, which of course left them weaker and more immunosuppressed uh, so that the disease was able to attack them, you know, more uh, easily. Um, so in this chapter, McRaney finally kind of gets to the point, which is that there is a method, he's going to call it scientific method, right, in which we can use, we can rely on, uh, that is out there in the world. It doesn't come naturally to us. Most people... Uh, you can learn how to use scientific method in your everyday life, but most people don't do that normally, right? Uh, but it's there for us. It can be learned, and it can be learned in a very kind of straightforward and simple way. We, in other words, 
you don't have to be a scientist to have access to scientific method, right? Um, but part of it in, involves, you know, initially searching for something that disproves what you already think. So it involves doing something uncomfortable, which is examining, let's say, a common belief that is held, uh, you know, for example, that um, young people are not at threat from the coronavirus or something like that, right? And then testing that theory, which maybe is both a commonly held belief and also one that if you're young uh, is kind of nice to believe, but instead of searching for ways to confirm your, your hypothesis or this commonly held belief, to search for ways to disconfirm it. And to, that is to subject it to testing, right? To say, okay, I would like to think this, uh, and lots of other people think it, uh, let's test it out by subjecting it to, to tests. Um, so that is kind of this idea that uh, normally um, we have these kinds of assumptions and that we are also sort of assuming a lot of the time that what we're told, especially by people who uh, are of our own cohort, uh, that is like our kind of, that we share these commonalities with, that these things are correct and right. Um, but uh, we, instead of doing that, we assume the opposite and proceed in this way. And this can lead us to a different types of experiences. Um, so he goes on, McCraney goes on to say that another thing that people really excel at, but, um, you know, maybe isn't always, you know, useful for trying to determine uh, ways of action, right, are by creating stories, by building these kinds of narratives. And that stories for us are very attractive. Like, we like telling stories, being told stories. And so the tendency is to try to kind of create a, a convincing or a compelling narrative that, um, you know, maybe doesn't have that much relationship to argument, but instead uh, is full of bells and whistles. <clears throat> and the more extreme and dramatic, the better, right? Uh, because it's more interesting. And uh, we like things that are extreme and things that you know, have uh, these kind of like, that they're scary or exciting uh, and we like to be moved emotionally. So we're searching for narratives that kind of provoke these inner states uh, sometimes instead of trying to test our, our hypotheses. Uh, so, you know, the point is, is that most of the time we don't have uh, the capacity to kind of test our, our, our these narratives or beliefs in, unless we start engaging um, with the assumption and with the knowledge that these kind of cognitive biases exist, right? So the first step to kind of building a, a, a part of your brain that's like, hmm, wait a second, uh, what am I thinking? What am I doing? You know, the part that it questions yourself uh, is to just kind of become aware of the fact that these tendencies, these fallacies, and these cognitive biases exist around us. All right, that's it for today.